Hello, this is AONM, the Academy of Nutritional Medicine, with our series on cancer support. We're delighted to have Dr. Joachim Flora with us today. He is a medical practitioner with many decades of experience. He's considered one of Australia's most experienced practitioners, in fact, and educators. He's um, widely regarded in the field of integrative and personalized medicine. His particular interest is tailored cancer management and the early adoption into clinical practice of evidence-based liquid biopsy and tumor profiling. He currently incorporates liquid biopsy in his own practice and um, has done since um, 2012 using the main track system, which is a German system of um, circulating tumor cell count. And he's going to be talking to us today about the effect of natural therapy and CTC, which stands for circulating tumor cells, CTC testing on patients with cancer. So without further ado, Joachim, we'll switch over to you and please do introduce anything further about yourself that you'd like to. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian and AON for inviting me to be part of that. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to do that. And I send greetings across the oceans from, uh, from Australia to, to the UK. Thank and you. Uh, I hope you, you're, all, you're all okay in these difficult times um, now. So um, we may start <clears throat> on this. We will, by the way, be open for questions. Um, so if you'd like to send in your questions to info at aonm.org, then we'll be having Dr. Flora on again in a few weeks to answer any questions you have. So please do send them. I'll repeat the address again to info, I-N-F-O at A-O-N-M dot org. Thank you. So just a way of, uh, of, of, of additional background. I'm a, I'm a medical practitioner, registered medical practitioner. Um, I've also done a degree in naturopathy uh, many years in Germany. Um, and I'm interested in, in science and in the translation of science into clinical medicine. So I'm going across all these spectrums uh, of that and hopefully um, I can enthuse you to, uh, to learn more and question more and um, hopefully together we'll come up with some better answers. <clears throat> I just need to go to the next slide. So in, in cancer management, there are a number of sectors and I've divided up the presentation into these, um, into these segments. And I think it's very important that we don't put cancer diagnosis or cancer management just as a blank statement like this, that we talk about the different stages of that. And there is primary prevention, that means preventing um, the cancer appearing in the first place. And as you know that, you know, statistically, there are one in two men and one in three women who will get um, some cancers in their lifetime. So it is a common, uh, a common condition. And if we can do active prevention, um, it's always better than cure. So that sentence still stands. But it's not just primary prevention, there's also secondary prevention, which is the prevention of the recurrence after the initial diagnosis and treatment of cancers. And I think natural therapies in particular have got a huge role to play in the secondary prevention um, after the initial treatment. And I'll talk a bit more about that. The other part is a co-treatment, that means can I or can I not do natural therapies in combination with standard medical treatments, um, with chemotherapy or radiotherapy or surgery, 
also an important question. Um, often there is a big confusion around that. <clears throat> so we'll talk a bit about that. Then there is symptom relief. Um, cancer patients do have a lot of symptoms um, and natural therapies can have a significant effect on that. We talk about compromised organ function. Uh, we talk about inflammation. We talk about pain. We talk about the mental anguish or stresses uh, which are involved in the diagnosis and treatment. All of those um, are important, uh, important aspects. And then there is metastatic disease um, and what can natural medicine. And here we also talk about testing, uh, diagnostic uh, opportunities, what can they uh, contribute to that. <clears throat> As you know, there are some, there are some good um, general information and I won't take too much of your time because you um, can look those up. Uh, Cancer Research UK uh, is one of the many sites which give you good information. But you know, I would just like to point out that um, that four segment here, uh, the preventable, um, it says that 38% of cancers are preventable. Um, it's a big number um, and, and it's an important one. And as practitioners, we can, be, uh, can play a big role in this. And it's not just smoking, there, there are many other factors. <clears throat> um, I won't read off all of those because you can see them in, um, uh, in those particular websites. Um, but it talks about the number of new cases uh, per year what kind of cancers they are, um, in which part of the country. Um, and it's, it says here that the incidence right on the bottom of it is ranked higher than two thirds of Europe. So UK has got a particular burden here um, and it's ranked higher than 90% of the world. So these are big numbers. Um, so. I think we as practitioners can contribute to um, reduce this incidence um, quite clearly. There's a bit more detailed about breast, prostate, lung and bowel cancers and the various cancers and what the um, um, incidence of those is. <clears throat> Smoking contributes to about 15% of this, so this is almost half of the preventable cancers, but there are many others. Um, in, in that. These are the preventable cancers. Um, and again, you can have a look at those uh, at, at, at the list. There's smoking, there's weight, which I know is a, a big issue for many people. Um, there's radiation, there's alcohol, there's processed meat and ionizing radiation, there's air pollution, and not enough physical exercise uh, or activity. Um, is also part, is mentioned here. The largest numbers is lung cancers um, in, in, the, in the UK uh, as preventable ca cases here. Um, bowel cancer, melanoma, skin cancer, breast cancer, they're the top four. <clears throat> breast cancer is an important topic. Um, because there, there is a lot we can actually do from a primary prevention, from a secondary prevention. It's now one in seven females in the UK will be diagnosed with breast cancer in a lifetime. And it says here that 23% of breast cancer cases in the UK are preventable. And the details are given here. <clears throat> Obesity is an important um, factor. And again, uh, when we talk about natural therapies, there is nutrition and lifestyle is part of natural therapies. Uh, again, there are many things that we can contribute um, to that. And that's important, not just in the prevention, but also in the, in the treatment, in the secondary prevention and in the treatment. Um, and again, we'll talk a bit about that. <clears throat> These are the various um, cancer sites which are associated with uh, overweight and obesity and you can have a look at that. <clears throat> so 
So there, there is, this is a, a US data, but it's very similar in, um, in, in other Western countries. Um, and you can see the, the significant percentages of the population starting with, with small children uh, into adulthood, which um, have are, um, are obese and uh, need to access that. <clears throat> the other one is, you know, important one is food. And let's just bring up one here. This is about vegetable consumption. Um, and you see there's a, a US figure here, uh, a chart where in many states it's 14% um, have more than three servings per day in the state. So there, there is plenty of what can be done. And we in Australia say anything which has got a color on it, that's green or blue or red or yellow, um, is, is possibly a good thing. And, and we talk about food which has got the color on it, not the package. Because what usually in the package is, is not very colorful. So the, the color on the package is not so important. It's the color of the food itself. <clears throat> the obesity is, uh, is going up, as you know, and um, I don't need to tell you more. Now, if we go into um, the more detailed and the, the evidence of how food, nutrition, obesity, and physical activity has an influence um, we can go down into the molecular details about that. And you can see on the, on the circle, on the outside, these are the hallmarks of cancers. So from apoptosis to cell cycle influence to the carcinogen, carcinogen metabolism to DNA repair to proliferation to hormonal regulation to differentiation, to inflammation and immunity, all of those areas which are important are affected by what we do, um, how active we are, what kind of food and what nutrition uh, we, we play. So I often hear from colleagues, from oncology colleagues, that um, when patients ask, what should I do anything with my diet, uh, they just say, eat a eat a normal diet, um, whatever that means, it doesn't mean very much. So you as practitioners who are interested in natural therapies um, would have probably done some education in nutrition and there is plenty of things we can, we can do and contribute. <clears throat> this is the reference um, uh, for, for that again, and you can read more details, the influence of uh, these areas. I just point out on top of that, it says inflammation. Inflammation, chronic inflammation is a well-recognized large contributor to cancer incidence and to cancer proliferation. Um, we also know it, that pain involved in cancer patients is very often in inflammatory response. So again, um, manipulating, modifying the inflammatory process is an important one. If that's from the kind of food we eat, if it's about the microbiome and the right probiotics, is it about various supplements, um, vitamins or botanicals, uh, there are many areas we, that we can influence that. Uh, on the right hand side, you find insulin resistance is a, is a common uh, process. And there are some protocols around which uses insulin sensitizers like metformin, and uh, which is now being often being part of a, a, a standard um, anti cancer protocol or as an additional protocol. Uh, to be used again to improve insulin resistance in that. <clears throat> now, um, we're talking uh, today also about the MANTRAC CDC testing. Um, can it be used before the diagnosis of cancer, which a lot of people ask? 
can I use it as a screening? And I will come back to that right at the end of the presentation, not right now. Um, but that's a common question which is which is being which is being asked. <clears throat> now, liquid biopsy is the biopsy taken from a liquid portion of the body. Obviously, blood is the main one, but it can be taken from from urine or the cerebrospinal fluid. But here we're talking about mainly uh, a blood specimen. So compared or in opposition to a tissue biopsy where you need an, uh, a surgical extraction of a tissue or a needle biopsy, uh, which is often difficult to achieve, a liquid biopsy is taking a blood sample. And what you can find in a blood sample are uh, CTCs, circulating tumor cells. So these are cells which have derived from a tumor. Um, and we'll again talk a bit more about that. Um, any At a time, a tumor is about one cubic millimeter in size. It sheds blood cells into the bloodstream. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. And they can be identified, and particularly the main track method is the most sensitive method of all CTC detection systems, uh, which has got a 96, 97% sensitivity of detecting circulating tumor cells. Um, and has been used, been validated, has been published for over 15 years um, with large clinical trials and is the most sensitive system um, around in circulating tumor cells. The other Things you can see in a blood sample is DNA. Um, these are circulating tumor DNA, CT DNA, or free DNA. Um, they have been, they can be examined, and you can uh, do genome analysis. You can measure mutations. Um, it, it contributes to um, a large data set. Uh, in cancer patients, it's very useful also. Additional things are exosomes or vesicles, uh, which are uh, extracted from cells, and particularly here from cancer cells, and they carry information um, from the cells. And one thinks that the spreading of these bubbles or exosomes across the body can happen very quickly, and that's how information gets carried from one cell to another. RNA, messenger RNA, um, can also be extracted out of the bloodstream and can be examined and analyzed. And there are many other things like proteins and so forth. Um, all of that comes together as a liquid biopsy. <clears throat> but here we mainly talk about the tumor cells and these are the tumor cells which we can pick from the bloodstream with this system here, uh, the main track system, are from solid tumors. We're not talking about tumor cells from leukemias or lymphomas or myelomas. We're talking about the common adenocarcinomas, sarcomas, um, which are solid cancers. So breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, uh, sarcomas, bowel cancers, pancreatic cancers, all of those, about 80% of all the malignancies um, can be identified, can, we can identify cells which have been shedding from the tumor into the bloodstream. And some people call them disseminated epithelial cells. So they have been disseminated around the body. Um, here we sometimes make it specific that these are separate from other tumor cells or other malignant cells like lymphomas. They're circulating epithelial tumor cells. So sometimes you see the E um, coming up in the CTCs, the circulating epithelial tumor cells. Near this picture here says there's a primary tumor outside a bloodstream. And if cells 
get released into the bloodstream here. Normally, cells from an epithelial tumor or epithelial cells do not have a place in the bloodstream. They get eliminated. Epithelial cells from cancers, in order to survive in the bloodstream, need to go through a transformation. It's called EMT or epithelial mesenchymal transformation. Um, so they can survive in the bloodstream. And these are the cells we can find in the, um, in the bloodstream and in the testing. And these are the cells, they're called then the met so-called metastatic cells. They have the capacity to extravasate, to get out of the bloodstream, back into the tissue and produce another tumor. So finding these cells here in the bloodstream with this particular technology has been very important to look at the risk of these. And as you can see later on, if the numbers in the bloodstream increase, that means it increases the risk of a cancer appearing again. On the contrary, if the numbers in, this, in the bloodstream decrease, if the CTC number in the bloodstream decreases, that's correlated with a low risk of a cancer appearing again in another tissue and is correlated with long-term outcomes. Um, this, as you can see, this publication is from 2009. Um, so the, the knowledge and the way that works has been around for quite some time. <clears throat> now, if you look at the development of solid tumors, it's the, it may start with one cell and it then grows into 1000 cell. Um, this is a fast growing tumor and in two years it might be 1 million cells. So 1 million cells on average um, has the size of one cubic centimeter. So just one centimeter size has got 1 million cells in it. And that may take two to three years to develop that for a, um, a fast growing tumor. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, the first one is a slow growing tumor and the bottom one is a fast growing tumor where it may take um, you know, less than that to develop to a larger tumors. <clears throat> Just as a background information, these are all different systems of CTC isolation. Um, we're taking a whole blood here and the main track testing that we're talking about today here is the only one which is an imaging technique. All the other ones use techniques of mechanical separation or enrichment. The problem with these systems is that through this processing of enrichment, it lose a lot of cells. And that's why these particular systems um, are not very sensitive and have very low numbers of cells that they can detect. Whereas the imaging technique does not do any filtering or magnetic bead enrichments or other kind of separation system. It looks at live cells and it's the only system which ends up with examining live cells in the bloodstream. So in the laboratory, when the blood goes to the laboratory, only the cells which are still alive at that time get tested. And this is also the only system which then allows us to do chemosensitivity testing, which means we can expose these live cells to um, treatment agents, chemotherapy agents, botanical agents, and see, at least in the laboratory, if they have got the capacity of killing those cells. It's the only system which can do that. Um, and I'll show you some pictures later on. The other thing we can do, we can grow these cells, if they're able to grow or willing to grow, into what's called tumor spheres. So we leave the cells in a nutrient medium, I leave them for about three weeks, and 
if they grow and multiply, it produces clusters, and that's associated with an advanced risk of an, another cancer appearing. We call them cancer stem cells or tumor spheres. Um, just very quickly uh, with, with, a, with a method, um, we have some, some blood um, and then we lyse or get rid of the red blood cells and we stain them with these APCAM antibodies. Um, and this is the green fluorescent and then we have a laser scanning microscope and, and can see those cells and count them. <clears throat> These are two examples um, where we, in the first one on top, um, where we find no particular cell, no EPCAM positive cells, no CTC. Um, so this is, a, if you like, a negative test. Um, on the bottom one, you see one example where we see 700 cells per mill. Um, so this is what we call a moderate increase number. We see sometimes numbers in, into the thousands, um, but it's not so much the absolute level of what we have, but the changes of these numbers over time. So if, a, if someone has 700 number, uh, 700 cell numbers in one test and the next test has got 300, then we say the numbers of these cells has reduced and that's a good sign. However, if it increased in 700 and next time has got 1200, then we say it's uh, substantially increased and that means some that the risk of progression of disease or cancer recurrence is also increased. <clears throat> we look at secondary prevention. This is for um, someone who has been diagnosed. Um, and then looking at preventing for this cancer to progress or recur in another organ and or locally. And there are a number of things that you can do, nutrition, lifestyle, nutrient supplementation, can decrease inflammation and the clotting risk. There's meditation and then obviously testing and the monitoring. <clears throat> and this is, this is what we're talking about here. There's the primary prevention, reducing exposure, um, to carcinogens, and then there's a secondary prevention, and there's also tertiary prevention. Because what we want to do is prevent the recurrence of metastases. Um, now, this is um, um, a fairly recent um, example of uh, about 1,300 tests um, in, a, in a study, and you can see very well. Um, what the differences are. And I'll explain that to you. Um, there, there is a green line saying these are people who have got a diagnosis of, um, of disease, of, of cancers, I'm sorry, go back one. And the green line is a decrease in cell numbers. Right? And they have a relapse-free survival, it means they don't have a recurrence. Whereas if you see the ones with increased numbers, which is the red line, um, very significant difference between the red line and the green line. So you can use this testing to see what the risk is for um, a recurrence of a tumor. <clears throat> now, what I would like to do is talk about uh, some of the substances that we that we use and and that that are important in this context uh, vitamin d as you know is um, uh, a common deficiency in people um, i've been testing vitamin d levels uh, for about 20 um, 20 years here and i'm continuously surprised and surprised in um, in, in what numbers of deficiencies there are and there are many publications there, so make sure that your patients are adequately uh, supplied with vitamin D. Um, and I have not seen many people that actually have got adequate numbers without supplementation. So that's, and this particular article 
course, talks about a vitamin D deficiency being a pandemic. Um, this kind of word is a, a familiar term now, uh, but vitamin D deficiency has been a pandemic for quite some time. Mm. And you can read, this is one of the articles um, from 2018, the anti-cancer effect of vitamin D and all the things he does. It goes into the pathways of cells, of P53, of apoptosis pathway, of angiogenesis pathway. So it's been very well studied, um, the effect of that. If you do one thing out of today is uh, and measuring and supplying your patients with vitamin D, then you know, I'm, I'm happy with that. So this is out of that particular article, um, the vitamin D metabolism and cancer, very important uh, to do that. Vitamin is not really a vitamin, it's more hormone, um, and it's important in DNA repair um, and in the prevention of progression of disease. <clears throat> the other area, which is very important, also very clear, is uh, organisms in the digestive tract and the bowel health. Um, and we can use probiotics um, in many ways, um, and it's been very well established. It's been very interesting. Um, you go back 10 years ago on cancer conferences, you talk to oncologists about probiotics, and they said, what's that? Um, not much known. Today, every, con every cancer congress that I've been, at, been to in the last two years, um, talks, these are standard oncology con conferences, talks about probiotics. So it's something uh, you, can, you can go into. Um, what, it, what it does, it um, uh, increases cytotoxic activity, increases survival rate, decreases tumor progression, and so forth. So it's both in prevention and a treatment. And people who um, do probiotics during chemotherapy do better. It's been very clearly established. So that's one thing you can do in combination with, um, um, with other cancer therapies. Vitamin D you can also do. <clears throat> Diet and cancer, um, I won't go too much into details. Um, but there is the good and the bad, and most of us know about the good and the bad. There are certain foods which triggers and promotes cancers, and they're called carcinogens, and the World Health Organization has a good list of those. There's also food which reduces cancer growth. This seems to be vegetables most of the time, and it seems to be those with colors on them. Um, we talk about green colors, talk about cruciferous vegetables, very well studied and, uh, and very good um, information available. Uh, the other important things are hormones in food. Hormones or growth promoters or pre-hormones are commonly used in agricultural production um, and are continuing to promote the activity of those cells which have got hormone receptors on them. So we're talking about estrogen receptors, for example, um, and we know that chicken, that dairy um, produce, beef in some, in some cases um, have pre-hormones and anyone with, an, with a hormone-related cancer has to be very careful in having those kind of foods. <clears throat> um, Overall, weight seems to be more important than the type of food. Um, fasting or not fasting, it's a topic for uh, maybe another presentation. Uh, there seems to be some good evidence that fasting can be of benefit, uh, but I advise patients not to go and fast during chemotherapy or during active anti-cancer treatment. Uh, because it's so stressful to the body that the b body needs to be nutritionally adequate. Um, 
the extreme dieting, there are some programs around of extreme dieting. I again have not found a consistent, good and positive response, except some uh, individual exceptions um, that extreme dieting is, 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 is useful. <clears throat> Talk about minerals and trace elements. These are some important ones, iodine, selenium, zinc and magnesium. It can be measured um, and it's useful to optimize the dosages um, and the range of those in the system. Bioflavonoids are important. We talked about cruciferous vegetables, the broccoli seed extract, ginger, quercetin, resveratrol, lycopenes. These are the colors um, in, some of the, in some of the foods. Um, these have been known for quite some time to have very good anti-cancer effect. Um, we now use them for um, treatment um, and use them intravenously as infusions. And it's been very, very interesting uh, results. One thing which is not on that list is curcumin. It should have been on that list. Um, very interesting results of that. <clears throat> so avoid cancer promoters in the food, hormones, the pro-inflammatory, excess sugar and carcinogens. <clears throat> this is just a list. I don't want you to go and read all of that uh, from the World Health Organization. They're all um, things which are known to be carcinogens and you can read that. <clears throat> um, this is a, short, a shorter list. There are aflatoxins in some of the uh, nuts, in particular peanuts. There's alcohol, dioxin, salted fish, acid aldehyde, hydrocarbons, nitrosamines, and so forth. These are well-known um, carcinogens in food and are best to be avoided um, both in, um, in prevention and in treatment. <clears throat> um, down at the bottom uh, talks about filtered water, organic food, and avoid the plastics. Um, I know many countries really provide water, drinking water in plastic bottles. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good idea. Uh, probably not, uh, because these low mineral waters in the, in the plastic bottles uh, absorb the plastics or plasticizers from the plastic bottles and it might end up worse. <clears throat> Here we talk about the hormone receptors. Um, there is again, there is mercury, there is xenoestrogens, there is pollutants, there is obesity, all having a negative effect on these uh, hormone receptors um, in promoting cancers. And then there is anti-hormones, there is I3C, there is food, there is cruciferous vegetables, which you can do to uh, compensate for that. These are some of the natural treatments, the lifestyle, nutrition, micronutrients, herbs, then um, nutrients or supplements in tablets or capsules or injections. There's biophysical, there's the mind, then there's spiritual treatment. If you go to some details, this is an article from 2006. I still use that um, just to um, point out that there is a lot of information around what substances um, do what effect on cancer. So it is, it is very well known what these substances do um, and you can read about it. Um, and what we can test um, with MainTrack on the CTCs to see if any of them are effective in killing of those cancer cells. So what we can do is expose, expose the circulating tumor cells from the patient in the laboratory to a therapeutic dose of, um, of these substances. We can obviously do it with chemotherapy too, but here with, um, with botanicals and natural health substances, we can expose them and see if at least in the laboratory, it kills them. Because if it doesn't kill them, 
then the substance might not be in the right concentration or the cells are resistant to it. And it's better not to use that substance. It's better to find a substance to which the cells are sensitive to. So you can use the testing to help you with that. <clears throat> Just a few words about vitamin C. There's always a controversy about it, that vitamin C or antioxidants should not be given with chemo or radiations because they're antagonistic. This is very confusing. Clinical evidence in animal and human studies do not support this idea of antagonism. There's nothing clinical published to date that shows an antagonism. On the contrary, the human clinical trials in combination with chemo are now rapidly increasing in number every year. Uh, vitamin C in combination with radiation trials are also appearing. So there is opinion that you should not combine it. The evidence is on the other side that combining it will improve outcome. <clears throat> there is significant publication um, in, in cancer treatment, National Cancer Institute, and you can look it up um, on the various cancer trials of what it is. These are this one of them, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, there are currently, with chemotherapy, two, 20 trials going on or more, uh, which use intravenous vitamin C with chemotherapy. About 11 or more with salt treatment and about four with radiation treatment. Um, what is being used? Um, about 60 gram to 100 gram of vitamin C at the same time as the chemo or after chemo um, and 80 grams with radiation therapy. That seems to be the dosages given in these, in these trials. So the effect of natural therapies is there are a number of um, points here. One is it's improving the effectiveness of anti-cancer treatment. So you have to look at combining it at the right time. Um, then it's reducing symptoms and increasing quality of life and improving the immune response mechanism. So we're not necessarily saying here have a natural therapy as an alternative to other therapies. What we're saying is you can combine natural therapies with other treatments to improve the effectiveness and reduce the symptoms. <clears throat> we can, we have been using and can use um, these botanicals, as I said before, um, as, as an alternative, and sometimes it becomes an alternative. Um, for example, curcumin, there's lots in vitro evidence and there are lots of practitioner experience and the human trials are ongoing. There is just one finished in, in, in Eastern Europe uh, which uses curcumin SRV plus chemo um, or chemo by itself in metastatic breast cancer with very, very good results for the combination. There are other bioflavonoids like ginger extract, resveratrol and quercetin, which are also being used. Here's a picture <clears throat> that comes from the hallmarks of cancer of Robert Weinberg. Um, there are about 10 main components in what, um, what drives and triggers and promotes cancer activity. Um, resisting cell death, deregulation cellular energetics. It's a big book. Um, you can go and read it. It's very interesting um, to do that. And the targeted therapies which are around in oncology, all aiming to reduce one or several of these steps. Um, and these are the PARP inhibitors and the glycolysis inhibitors, the EGFR inhibitors, the telomerase inhibitors, and so forth. These are all inhibiting drugs. And you can see there are just some examples of nutrients or plant extracts, which have got very similar effects on these pathways. So, there is plenty, um, plenty of options. There are plenty of options and plenty to know. <clears throat> now, what we do in the laboratory, we're testing for the sensitivity of any of these substances 
as a direct cytotoxic assay. So the question to the lab is, has the substance that could be curcumin, could be quercetin, could be vitamin C, has the ability to kill cancer cells? So the main track CDC test is the only test which can test the effectiveness of a substance on live tumor cells. There is no other test around which can do that. Other tests use gene mutations and the statistics from the past or use RNA methods, and it's not using the therapeutic concentration on this. So the main track is the only test which gives you in a therapeutic concentration the effectiveness of the substance to be able to kill these tumor cells. <clears throat> It's published, and you can read that, and it goes back to 2013, uh, where the initial publication was. Since then, there have been many more, and there is plenty of experience. And this is the, the testing is done in the laboratory, and you can see some of that here. This is with some chemotherapy um, substances, docetaxel, epirubicin, and mephosphamide, and you can see. The, the green one is a, is a live tumor cell, this one here. And over time, and you can see after three and a half hours, seven hours, and 10 hours, this cell gets invaded by the, by the red substance, which is a substance which can only go to, uh, through a damaged membrane. So in the beginning, this is a live cell, there is no red inside, and it ends up after a few hours being damaged. And that's how, you, how the testing is being done. So you're exposing a live cell to a therapeutic substance and see over a period of a few hours if that cell dies. And that's the basic. Um, and you get a response, maybe 10% of the cells or 50% or 100% of the cells get killed by that substance. And here are some examples. It's, these are the number of patients. Unfortunately, this is in, in, in German, but you can see the, the, the drift here that for vitamin C, for example, um, you find that in about a third of the patients, um, almost all of the circulating tumor cells in the laboratory get killed. But there's another third over here where the cells don't get killed by this concentration of vitamin C. So it is worthwhile finding out. So vitamin C doesn't kill the cancer cells always or for every patient it kills some of them and it's worthwhile knowing it. And if you know that, then you can use it. Here on the bottom is curcumin. And you see it has been, in comparison to vitamin C, uh, has a much greater effect on these cells. So you find you know, at least half, if not more, of all of the cancer of the patients with these with circulating tumor cells where um, a substantial number, close to 100% of all the cells are being killed by the substance in the laboratory. So it gives us a rationale to use treatments as such. And this is how it's being reported. Um, for example, this is a patient who has got um, colon cancer. And the cell numbers, you can see that there are 500 cells in that. And and down here on the bottom is the percentage of cells which are being killed off by this substance. So 70% of all the cells get killed off by vitamin C. Um, there is artesanate down here, 95% of all of the cells are being killed by artesanate. On the right hand side, at this example, there's only 40% of cells being killed by, um, by a particular form of, uh, of, of curcumin. So it helps um, selecting the right kind of treatment for the patient. Um, this is the vitamin C example. This is the artemisia or the wormwood example, um, which helps us um, 
again, deciding if that patient would be useful for that day's curcumin. Now, one other topic is the, the tumor spheres or culture. Um, what we do here is see if there are cancer stem cells in the bloodstream, which then, if we put them into a nutrient medium, provides clusters. So they start dividing up. So here on the right hand side, you see um, a flask, and these dots here are cultures of cells. So they have come from one cell, from one circulating tumor cell, or from one stem cell, and producing a cluster. If that happens, we know that the cells are able and willing to produce um, tumors um, if they're not being. Uh, prevented from doing so by, I guess, by the immune system or by therapies. So the presence of these tumor cells um, in the patients indicate an aggressiveness um, and a high risk of producing metastases, um, and then treatments can be implemented. What we can also do, we can test those clusters for their sensitivity. So we can test them against chemotherapy substance. We can test them against uh, botanicals. We also know that chemotherapy under those circumstances is very, has very little effect. Um, it's been well known and there is a, a huge uh, desire to find medicines um, which can kill these cancer stem cells. Um, Fortunately, there are a lot of botanicals which, which can do that. <clears throat> this is just another picture of these cluster. So after about three weeks, um, you see you know, um, numbers of cells growing out of one single cell. <clears throat> this is one of the tests, it's in the, in the publication. Um, you can see the effect of substances, here are the names of various chemotherapy agents, and then there's uh, salinomycin, which is a, an antibiotic, um, and there's curcumin. Uh, the light gray picture shows us the effect of cell killing on CTCs, um, and the dark gray one would be the effect of cell killing um, on the tumor spheres. And you can see in, in, on the left-hand side, in the, in the middle, uh, with most chemotherapy agents, there is very little effect on the tumor spheres. On the right-hand side, there is this um, uh, antibiotic, salinomycin, and there is curcumin, which seem to have a good effect on killing off the tumor stem cells. <clears throat> These are some of the pictures out, uh, out of the publication. Um, um, in, in the actual picture. So you can see the, the cluster of cancer stem cells here or the tumor spheres, even after nine hours of exposure to these substances, um, there's hardly any effect. Whereas you see the effect down here in salinomycin and in curcumin um, has been quite effective in this particular study to kill that. So knowing um, what would kill them, um, or if the substance which is being proposed uh, to kill the tumor um, uh, is actually effective, you can do that. <clears throat> I promised in the beginning that I talk just a little bit about early detection. Um, can we use CTC testing for early detection? This is for people who have never had any cancer. I think this is quite an early, um, and I just want to put that out as a teaser of maybe this is something we can engage in in the future. This is um, 136 patients uh, that we have done without a diagnosis of cancer, and you see the distribution of circulating tumor cells. So there are some of these cells available uh, or are around there. We've taken those samples or those patients which have um, a high number of these CTCs 
and expose them to um, diagnosis like PET scans and MRIs. And we found a high number. So these are five and then in the end six, six number out of 15, um, we could identify, this is within a short period of time, um, could identify a small cancer which has been um, removed surgically um, and these patients have been very well. So we're very happy with these early, early results of these testing. What we're doing, if there are a number of CTCs, we've exposed people to various treatments, uh, prevention treatments, usually natural treatments, and retested them to see, to see if, um, if they improve. And um, in the future, we'll tell you a bit more about the, um, the outcome of, of these ones. So these are prevention strategies um, in various levels uh, based on the CTCs. So this is just a, a bit of a, a background of this particular research that we're doing. Um, I hope that I've been able to give you um, an idea and a, and a bit of a summary of natural therapies um, and how we can use CTC testing to help us um, in our cancer patients to help them and help us uh, to select treatments which hopefully can be effective. And um, I'll be available to um, discuss some questions when they come up. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Flora. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so you've been using this yourself for, you said the um, technique has, the, of liquid biopsies has been available for at least 15 years. You've been using it for a lot of that time with your patients. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I, would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I think, you know, it's, it's been such a, um, a reliable um, um, and beneficial um, ammunition, if you like, in a diagnosis to help with the patients. It's not telling us everything. So I'm still using the standard medical testing of imaging and other blood tests. This is in, in addition, mm -hmm. but it, it helps, us, helps me to be more personalized um, and to identify patients who could benefit from other additional treatment or where you can find that the current treatment plan has not been effective um, and look for options. Amazing, thank you very, very much. Well, we'll be coming back to you if that's all right in a few weeks with sure. listeners' questions. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to mention that the Academy of Nutritional Medicine, AONM, um, liaises these tests for the UK. And um, so please just call our helpline if you're interested. There is actually an entire section on the aonm.org website about main track testing. And we have a helpline which will um, explain to you exactly how to um, obtain the kit and do the test. Um, it's just two small files of um, EDTA blood, isn't it? They don't even need spinning. And, no, and the no, results... It's come back very quickly, I think, within, you know, sometimes within two or three days. Yes, so EDTA tubes um, is, is the standard collection tubes and it should not be frozen or refrigerated, so it's easy to, to transport. But we have sp specific um, transport containers, but you can find that out from, if, you, if, if, your, if your listeners call you uh, or, or call the IONM, um, line and find out those details. Yes, um, MainTrack um, does the circulating tumor cells that Dr. Flora has mainly been speaking about today, as well as the um, testing of any potential stem cells um, that may be found in the blood. It also does a whole raft of um, therapy relevant characteristics of cells and um, we'll be having um, Professor Katrina Pachmann from the Main Track Laboratory speaking about those particularly in the next um, session on this, and um, perhaps Dr. Flora as well, telling us a little bit more about those and his experience in clinical practice um, the Happy. next time. Happy to do so. So, thank you very, very much again, Dr. Flora. Tremendous. Thank you again. And, um, we look yes. forward to having you on again. Thank, thank you again you for much. inviting me.
All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.